Um, so we come to our Bible reading. All right. So let, let's let's um, read from First Corinthians, uh, chapter one this evening. And after I read that, I'll I'll explain what I've got on my mind um, as far as the service is concerned. So First Corinthians and chapter one. Verse 1. Paul called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be his holy people, together with all those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in him you have been enriched in every way, with all kinds of speech and with all knowledge. God thus confirming our testimony about Christ among you. Therefore you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will also keep you firm to the end, so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, who has called you into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. So what's on my mind uh, to speak about here uh, tonight is um, the whole idea of how we see the church. Now, the reason I, I say that is that I think it, it's fair to say that during the course of people's lives at times, the, the church, rather than being a positive help and encouragement, can sometimes actually be a source of discouragement and some people become cynical as far as the church and, and they feel as though they have been burned you know and sometimes people even use words like toxic you know to ex explain and describe their, their experiences over the years and for people who are not believers and they look at the institution um, you know they, they don't really want much to do with that at times and even for those who are believers, there is a degree of, of hesitancy and caution and uh, a wee bit of uncertainty because of either experiences they have had or they have heard others uh, that have had. Um, and you can understand that. You, don't, you can understand that, for instance, this is why I've chosen to read a wee bit from the book of First Corinthians. All right. So let, let me just, you know, as always, um, this is going to be a, a wee bit different tonight, I should say, in that um, I, it's going to be almost like a, a Bible study, in that I've got, I've got quite a number of references that I'm going to be taking you to. I'll maybe get a bit of help with them on the overhead if I can speak slowly enough. Uh, but you, you, I, I hope you would find it helpful to turn to these if you can, while you go on, just just so that you get the full force of what I'm driving at. So, I mean, here here's Corinth, which of course is in Greece, and and we just touched on on the first of the problems in this church. Paul had gone, visited, preached. People had got converted, and uh, things began to happen as uh, the Christians come together and they meet and they interact and what's going on here. All right. So he starts by saying, verse 10 here, uh, you know, I, I, well, I've got to appeal to you here. Please let there be no divisions uh, among you. I, I really want you to be united in, in mind and thought. And, you know, there, there are little factions and little groups that have kind of cliques that have developed within the church. If you read down to verse 12, you know, have latched on to various personalities as far as the church is concerned and you know I'm, I'm, I'm Peter's man and you know Paul is who I'm after oh no I'm, I'm the Lord and nobody you know and all of this is happening and it's it's such a disappointment as far as Paul is concerned 
And he says to them, you know, please uh, be united. Now, that's not the only problem. That's bad enough. But if you go through this book, and I'll just give you a few examples. I don't, I don't want to make this a complete downer tonight, but I'll give you a few examples of what was going on in the church. So, for instance, if, um, if you were to turn to chapter 3 and verse 1, he says, Brothers and sisters, you know, I, I, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still, still worldly, mere infants in Christ. He'd hoped that they would have developed, that they would have matured, that they would have grown beyond the milk stage. And he says, you know, I'm so disappointed. You know, I expect, that's what I expected, but I found that you're you're worldly. You've, you've hardly moved on at all. You're not spiritual people. Chapter 5 gets even worse. Verse 1. It's actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and of a kind that even pagans do not tolerate. A man is sleeping with his father's wife, and you are proud. You know, they thought they were great. They really thought they were great. And they, uh, and they could complete blind spots as far as some things were concerned. And he has, to, he has to highlight and confront them about this. You go on to chapter 11, verse uh, 17. You would have thought that one of the things that maybe they would have got right was when they met together to remember the Lord, to observe the Lord's Supper. And yet... He has something to say about that as well. Verse 17 of chapter 11. In the following directives, I have no praise for you. Now look at this. For your meetings do more harm than good. You know, they come together to remember the Lord. He said, I, I, I wish you wouldn't bother. You know, your, your meetings are doing more harm than they're doing good. And then, maybe I can just give you one more. As I say, I, don't, I really don't want to make this <laughs> total pessimism. Uh, chapter 14, verse 23, talks about how the church functions, everybody trying to play their part, but that they've got everything out of perspective. You know, they're, they're, and, 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 the, and the use of the spiritual gifts that have been given is just, it's just a, a, big, a big ego trip for people. You know, and they're using all these, what they think are the dramatic sign type of gifts, speaking in tongues and so forth. And they're highlighting all of this above and beyond everything else that goes on in the church. Uh, and look what, what he says in chapter 14 and verse 23. If the, if, the ch if the whole church comes together and everyone speaks in tongues and inquirers or unbelievers come in, Will they not say, you're out of your mind? These folk are gone, you know. They say, they say they're a church. I, mean, I don't know, I think we're going back there. They're wild, you know. They're out of their mind. So there's a whole, there's more, but I'm not going to go through it. There's a whole catalogue of things. And you could almost imagine Paul saying, you know, I've just got it. I think I'll just walk away from this. I think I'll just uh, wash my hands of all of this. Uh, they're just dis completely dysfunctional as a church. Now, we could understand that, couldn't we? He doesn't do that. And that takes us back to where we had a reading, actually, in chapter 1. So I, del I, mean, I deliberately chose to start there because look at what he says in verse 2. Despite all of that, you know, just... Bear in mind what, what we've gone through. Despite all of that, he says to the church of God in Corinth, those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be his holy people, together with all those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. And, and what he's trying to do throughout the course of this, this letter that he writes to them is he's trying to address these issues. And, and he's trying to teach them. And, of course, he's doing that in the expectation that they will buy into that, take it to heart, 
and, and they will change. Actually says here in verse number 5 that, again, despite all these deficiencies, in him you have been enriched in every way. Um, and what he says in verse number 9 is that God is faithful. You know, despite their problems, God is faithful who has called you into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And so he doesn't give up on them. And you, of course, know that he, only, he didn't just write on one occasion. He wrote twice. Actually, probably wrote three times if you, if you read 2 Corinthians. But there is a 2 Corinthians. And his approach is kind of vindicated in 2 Corinthians. Because, you know, he takes up some of these things and, and, and he shows how they had responded and how, how they had been sorry for their behavior, and how they had changed their behavior. And so, despite all the kind of, whew, you know, that we've started off with today, Paul sticks with them, and, and, and the people change. And I think one of the big reasons for, for Paul's approach is that he had a real understanding of what the church was. All right, of what the church was. And so, you know, this is, this is my main message, my main point tonight. It is to, is to learn to see the church as God sees the church. You know, not as how we at times see it, you know, or how it's painted in some circles, or how, how our own particular experience has kind of caricatured that for us. But to get back, despite the fallings, the failings, to see the church as how God sees the church. It's not an institution. Let's, let's be clear on that. We all know it's not a building. We know that, you know. Uh, but it's not an organization. And it's not an institution. It is something much, much more than that. And that's what I want to try and just bring out of some of these things that I'm going to take you through uh, tonight. So, the first point... I want to make is this, point number one, the church is God's church. All right, now that's what it says there, doesn't it? Verse two, it's the church of God in Corinth. Now, they can't say, you know, if you went down there, this was Paul's church. Paul came, he preached, he set it up, he instituted it all, he flew the flag. It's really Paul's church. No, 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 no. And it's not Peter's and it's not Apollos either. All right, even though they were big names, if you like, in the early church. His thing, the reason he's got this view, is he's absolutely crystal clear on this. That this is the church of God. It doesn't belong to any of us. You know, we, it's not our little empire. You know, we don't run the show. We don't make the decisions. It's, it's God's church. And that's a very, very important point. Now, I've got a few... Other, other references, just to back this one up. Um, Matthew chapter 16. This is a very well-known reference. And verse number 18. And this is the Lord Jesus. And he's speaking. And it's Peter who's involved. And he says to Peter, On this rock I will build my church. Not, not Peter's church, all right? I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now, now that is the, the first implication, if you like, of it being God's church. That the gates of hell will... I mean, if it was my church, you know, it would quite quickly dis disappear down the pan at times, you know. But it's not... And that's why, despite all the problems, and despite the persecutions, I mean, just to say this, actually, a couple of weeks ago, we were in St. Andrews because a friend of ours was being baptized. And we had the service, and after the service, the girls gave their testimony, we walked through the town because it was going to be in the sea at uh, what they call Castle Sands in, in St. Andrews, just right next to the castle. And as we walked down, 
I, I knew this was there, but I was looking out for it because some of you will know this as well. There's a memorial on on the ground to the to the mar to two martyrs, you know, Patrick Hamilton and the other one just escapes me just now, um, who were burned. Wishart, George Wishart and Patrick Hamilton. Thanks. And um, and we we walked right past that as we went down to the sands and and the, the folks were baptized. You know, the cross before me the world behind me, you know, and it was almost as if what they had said, you know, and the, the people would have thought, they're, they're, they've been burned to death, all that's gone, it's all finished, but the gates of hell will never prevail against the church. And in fact, let me just remind you that there are only two things in this world that are eternal, you know, and it's uh, the word of God, you know, Prize that heaven and earth, Jesus said, will pass away. My word, this this book, the book of books that we are reading from, the Bible, will never pass away. Just why it's so important for us to go through it. And 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 the and the people of God, the church of God. And you know, and after the the smoke of battle has all cleared, you know, uh, and the and and the mist is all you know, faded away, there she will stand. You know, despite, you know, the, the, the demise that has been prophesied so many times of Christianity, you know, and the people of God, the church will, st that's what the Lord Jesus says, the gates of hell. Now, let me just tease that out a wee bit. Because when, when, when that phrase is used in the Bible, the gates of hell, you know, we mustn't necessarily think of you know, a wooden six-post gate thing. You remember the story of uh, of Ruth in the Old Testament when Boaz went to have the conversation about Ruth and it said that he met with the city elders who did what? They sat in the gate. That's what it means when it says the gates of hell. It's the it's the elders. It's the, it's the if you like, it's the principalities and powers, all the wisdom of hell, all right? All of that will never prevail against my church because I will hold it fast. And that's a great encouragement for all of us here. You know, we might think we're, we're small, we're failing, we've been hitting our head against the wall for generations here, what's been happening, all the rest of it. It's my church. You know, and, and the gates of hell will never prevail, and I will hold you fast. So that's a fantastic point to make about the implications of it being his, his church. Now, let me take you to another one. Still under this same point. Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. Paul is meeting here. Um, with the Ephesian elders, all right, he calls them, he's on his travels, calls them to the beach, and he has got something to say to them. Uh, so here, here are the, the elders of the church, and, and, Paul, and Paul goes through a little testimony thing, actually, about his life and his, you know, priorities and all the rest of it. And, and, and we're breaking into this at verse number 28, um, uh, and, and this is what he says. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit um, has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God which he bought with his own blood. Why is it the church of God? He bought it. He bought it with the blood of his own, his own blood. I mean, what a statement that is. God's, the, the blood of God, you know, which of course is, our eyes are turned to the, the death of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who loved us, and who gave himself, and who ransomed us. You know, the precious blood of Christ. We're not redeemed with perishable things. We're, re we're redeemed with something precious. And he gave himself, he loved the church. And he gave himself up for her. And that's why it is his church. He's bought us with a tremendous price. And so we focus on our, our Lord Jesus Christ. 
and, and his love. And I've, I've already just quoted there the next reference, actually, which is Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 25. And this is where the, the analogy of, of the church as the bride of Christ is introduced. He loves his church, and he refers to the church as, as his bride his dearly loved bride. And so this is in the middle of the section where, you know, he's, he's giving teaching to, to husbands and, and, and wives within this local church in Ephesus. And he says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish but holy and blameless. And so this is a description not only of one thing that was done at a point in history when Christ gave himself upon the cross as a, as a great demonstration of his love but it's an ongoing process of love as well that is described here. To present her to himself as a radiant church. His ongoing work of love with his, his people that will take them right through to the end. So let, let's, let's go right to the end then. Let's go to the, the book of Revelation and just to see in verse 20, in chapter 21, um, how this is kind of concluded if you like. verse 2 of, of Revelation 21 where it says I saw the holy city the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying look God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them and they will be his people God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. Every time I, I read that phrase, I, remember these old, these old uh, pictures used to get of Red Square in, uh, in Moscow, you know, when it was the Soviet Union and the, the Politburo was, was all kind of stony-faced men lined up there. And, and, and then every now and again it would change. The old order would be removed, you know. You know, as far as this, the, the troubles and the, and, the, and the sicknesses and the illnesses and the concerns of this world are concerned, there'll be a day that will all be referred to as the old order. <laughs> and the old order will go. And the new thing will come. And that will be for the bride of Christ. That's you and me. You know, if we have received Christ's love into our own hearts, received him and responded to that, we become joined to Christ in this, this union of intimacy that, that we are referred to as his dearly loved bride. And, 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 he, and he'll make sure we're with him all the way through, even to the end. Now, um, let me just, how are we doing? Right, we better cut this short a wee bit. So um, what, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take a slightly different analogy. It's, it's the, it, the church is, is God's church. Second point is this then. It's uh, that the church is an object lesson. Uh, of God's wisdom. Now I'll show you, I'll hopefully we'll show you what I mean by this. You know, you know what an object lesson is. Some of you go into the schools and you get the children to dress up, you do the Bible alive, you got the visual stuff, helps them to understand it's an object lesson of the point that you're going to be making. Did you know that the church is actually described as being an object lesson? Now it's in Ephesians again actually, chapter 3 and verse 10. And in this passage, he's talking about, about the church and, and, and the fact that it's a, it's, in one sense it's a mystery which was hidden for generations. But, but now, at this time, 
uh, uh, has been revealed. And look at, look, at, look at what he says in verse 10. God's intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. Have you ever thought about that? What's the point of the church? What are one of the points of the church? God's intent is that through the church, his, his wisdom, not just his wisdom, says his manifold wisdom, uh, the idea of, you know, many colors, you know, many God's wisdom in all its varied hues, you know, its, its expansiveness, it's not just monochrome, you know, it's, it's a tremendously colorful thing, if you like, so many dimensions to it, God's wisdom. And, and God's wisdom is on display. And it's on display through his people who have been saved by his grace. Who have been called to him, his church. And, and as the, the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms look on, we referred to some of them recently, but I don't think that's just evil. It's not just satanic and demonic. It's also angels and archangels. You know, they, 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 they look on, on and, and, and they have never known redemption, like we have known redemption. And, they, and they, look, they look at all these people, they look at, you know, people who have, you know, like, like the man called Legion uh, that Jesus met in the tombs, cutting himself, and nobody could tame him. And, 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 and Jesus goes, and he, he's sitting in his right mind, clothed and saying, Lord, let me come with you. And he said, no, no, you just stay here and tell what great things the Lord has done. And they're looking at this and all the other examples, you know, through the Gospels, the Book of Acts, all through history, even up into us, our terms of folks, you know, who were lost and who've been saved by the, by the grace of God. And, and it's, the, it's, the, it's, the, it's the variegated wisdom of God. And, and they look at it and they wonder at what God has done. And it's the church that is the, is the way that God is displaying his wisdom to, to angels and demons. I mean, does that not put things in a slightly different perspective? You know, we look at ourselves, we're bumbling along, we're doing this and that. But as we're doing all of that, this is what is happening. This is what's taking place. So it's a massive thing. And... Um, what I want to do now, I'm editing as I'm going through here, but uh, what I want to do now, because this is a favorite bit of mine, is um, I want to give you an illustration of how God sees his church. Um, I, got a, I got a present uh, a year or so ago of uh, cycling glasses. And I go out on my bike and um, there are different lenses that you can put in these things. And, and one of the, I actually had, had, a, had a kind of favourite one, I scratched it, you know, so I couldn't see right out of them. So I put these other lenses in, and they've got a kind of pinky hue on them. And I was out cycling one, and I thought, what a beautiful leaf it is tonight. <laughs> you know, man, just, just look at that sky, it's absolutely lovely. And I took the glasses off one, but I thought, oh, it's a bit, a bit grey now, you know. <laughs> and so, of course, you, you, can, you can be um, accused of looking at life through rose-tinted spectacles. All right, the, what we're doing tonight actually reverses this. We have the tendency to see everything as being grey. The rose tinted stuff is actually the reality. You know, as far as the church is concerned. Now, now let, me, let me show you this favourite bit of mine, okay? We're back in the book of Numbers, way back in the Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. Uh, and initially in chapter 23. And this is the story of Balaam. Remember Balaam and the donkey, you know, the speaking donkey. Well, here's the background. Ba Balaam's a sorcerer, all right? And he's hired by the king of Moab to curse the people of God, all right? The people of God are still on their, their travels from Egypt to Canaan, 40 years, and they're, and they're passing by uh, Moab and Balak the king is is anxious about all of this, 
And uh, he thinks the way to deal with it is to have a curse placed upon them by this sorcerer called, called Balaam. And he, and he takes them up onto a high mountain and, and they, look, they look down and, you know, the, the hordes of the people of Israel are, 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 are traveling along the desert. All right. Now, if you, if you were down there in the desert with them, along with Moses, you know, and, and this is not conjecture, you know, because there's plenty of examples of this elsewhere in the book of Numbers. If you were down there day after day, you would know what it was like. You know, they were moaning their heads off all the time. I mean, they, 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 they drove Moses to distraction. You know, and, it, and at one point, Moses lost the plot, actually. And you know how he was barred from getting to the promised land uh, because of that. So it was just, they were always wanting to go back to Egypt. They were complaining about Moses. They were complaining about God. All right. It was, it was not an easy journey. All right. And that's them down there. And, 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 and Balak brings Balaam up the top and says, there they are, place the curse on them. And, and this is him, all right? Uh, chapter 23 and verse 8. What comes out of his mouth is not what he intended to come out of his mouth. God put a prophecy, an oracle, into the, vo into the, the mouth of Balaam. And look at this. How can I curse whom God has not cursed? How can I denounce those whom the Lord has not denounced? Verse 10. Who can count the dust of Jacob or number even a fourth of Israel? Let me die the death of the righteous and may my final end be like theirs. So despite all of this, this is how God looks on them. For all their failings, they're his people. And, and Balaam said, I wish I was like one of them. I wish my end was like their end. You know, I can't put a curse on them. God has blessed them. There's more as well. If you go down uh, now to uh, ch uh, the same verse, um, the same chapter, sorry, uh, and verse number 21. No misfortune is seen in Jacob. No misery observed in Israel. The Lord their God is with them. The shout of the king is among them. Marvelous. Verse 23, where it says, There is no divination against Jacob, no evil omen against Israel. It will now be said of Jacob and of Israel, See what God has done. And it goes on. In fact, if you look at chapter 24 and, and verse number 17, I mean, this is remarkable. Balaam is able to make a prophecy about the Messiah. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star will come out of Jacob. A scepter will rise out of Israel. That's a prophecy about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. A way back here. Through, through a sorcerer. You know, and that is why they were the people of God. Through them, there was going to come the Savior that would, that would reach out to all of humanity. And that was how God looked on his people. In this way, despite their shortcomings. Now, we're nearly finished. I've got a couple of examples from the Psalms as well about this. So, um, let me just, again, I'm editing here. Let's go to Psalm 68. Psalm number 68. And at verse number um, 24. Psalm 68. Now, what's happening here, if you, look at, if you look at the very beginning of this psalm, may God arise, may his enemies be scattered. All right, so there are enemies all around. And um, in Psalm 68, verse 24, um, he, he begins to make a description of the people of God in a procession. Your procession, God, has come into view. The procession of my God 
and king into the sanctuary. In front are the singers, after them the musicians, then are the young women, and then verse 27, there's the little tribe of Benjamin leading them, there's the great throng of Judah's princes, and so forth and so on. And, and it's almost as if he's, he's taking them on a kind of, uh, um, you know, a tour. And he's saying, you know, look at this. There's Benjamin, there's Judah, and, you know, it's, it's, it's a wonderful procession. You know, and these, are, these are the Lord's people. And, 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 and we should look at the positives. And we should look at, at what we are in, in, in the eyes of God himself. And, and be uplifted with that, uh, rather than uh, having all the negatives, um, the tendency uh, of, of cynicism uh, that comes. Now, a couple of, just to close, implications. Okay, we've tried to see the church as God sees the church. Now, are there any other implications to that? If we begin to think in this way and look at things in this way? Well, I think, I think there are. The very next psalm, actually, 69. Look at what he says here. Verse 6. Lord, the Lord Almighty, may those who hope in you not be disgraced because of me. That's, a good, that's, that's good, isn't it? That is good. To have that kind of attitude that... I'm, th I'm, I'm thinking about I'm thinking about circumstances and how I might behave or conduct myself in these circumstances but I'm not just thinking about myself I'm thinking about the people of God and how that might have a bearing upon them how, my, how, how people might see the church how, might, how people might see those who hope in you you know that because of what I do, they might be put to shame because of me. I mean, that's a good way to think, isn't it? It's this whole idea of, you know, the church as a body, we're, we're all integral and we're all dependent on each other. And, you know, I've got strengths and I've got weaknesses. So have you. We need each other to complement one another. And, you know, what I do might negatively impact you. And I need to think in that kind of way. And so we should be thinking in terms of this verse and making that our kind of prayer. May those who hope in you not be put to shame because of me. And, the, and, and another one here in, in Psalm 73 at verse 15. Now in this psalm, if you look at the start of it, he, he's nearly lost his way altogether. All, all, all you know, my, my feet had nearly slipped. You know, I'd, I'd nearly lost my foothold. I looked at the wicked and, you know, I envied them and, you know, got everything out of perspective. Totally. And then he says this in verse number 15. He said, you know, he's, he's saying actually verse 13, first of all, he says, you know, this, this has all been pointless, me, me living for God. Surely in vain I've kept my heart pure. It's, it's just been a waste of time. Verse 13, uh, 15, if I had spoken out like that, look, I would have betrayed your children. Okay, now it's the implications on each other. The things that I say, you know, the things that I believe, the things that I do, it could be a betrayal of my brothers and sisters. And, and, and that was one of the things that held them and stopped them slipping into this spirit of cynicism. You know, and put things back into the proper perspective where they should be. I can't, I, you know, I must, I must think of, of the people of God. And I can't betray them, you know, by, by doing it in those ways. So, we'll, I think we'll just leave it at that uh, tonight. I, you know, as I say, that, that, that has been my overarching kind of objective. Was to, to say, okay, we, we, we're a little church here, you know. But we're not just a little church. You know, let's, let's look at things from, from the perspective that God sees his church. His, in fact, there are so many pictures and analogies. If you want to go and you know, do a bigger kind of study, his, his, you're the building of God. You know, you're the bride of Christ. You're the body of Christ. You're like a lampstand and Christ walks among. I mean, all these things 
this is how God looks upon his people. And it's good for us to try and look at things in the same way. Thank you. Will I pray? Yeah. Dear Lord, how grateful we are for your grace and your goodness that we've been able to have your, your book uh, before us tonight, your spirit among us. And our hearts have been lifted as we think that as those who have placed our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus and in his finished work upon the cross of Calvary, that, Lord, we are now your people, filled with your spirit, and uh, we'll be taken as the bride of Christ right through to the end. And so, Lord, help us to see the implications of that, of seeing not as people would, would look upon us as being weak and ineffective, but being a glorious church. And uh, Lord, thank you for that. And may we go in the, in the full enjoyment and realization of these things. We again pray a blessing upon your people here in Inverbervie and their work and lives and witness for you. We again just pray for Ken and Veronica at this time that your hand of healing might rest upon them. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.